Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining our, uh, our capital raising event today. Um, we're really excited to be uh, bringing this to you and, um, and I'm excited about the panel that we've actually got today um, to talk to you. Um, uh, my name's Callum Davidson. Um, I look after partnerships and community at Cake Equity. Um, we've got uh, Brett here from BoardPro um, uh, working on um, governance uh, and board management. Um, and we've also got Alex here from Sprint Law. Um, so um, I'll just wait a couple of minutes while people join in. I'd love to, to you guys to actually uh, jump on the chat and actually share any questions or any particular questions you want us to address as we go through the presentation today. Um, we do have a fair bit of content to get through, so we'll try to get through that pretty quickly. Um, but if you have questions as you go through, please drop them in the chat and we'll make sure that we leave time for Q&A at the, at, at the end. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, hopefully get through all the, all the questions you actually drop in the chat along the way. Um, so yeah, um, just brief introduction for myself while more people are actually joining the, uh, joining the uh, webinar. Um, so yeah, as I said, my name's Cal Davidson. Um, I look after partnerships and community at Cake Equity. Um, my background is um, equity markets and, uh, and financial services. So I've spent 20 odd years uh, in, in equity markets and financial services. Um, I've been with Cake for about three years now. Um, and um, you know, I do a lot of work with founders and also with accelerators and, and VCs, helping their portfolio companies with the two, two um, big issues that we, that we look to um, solve for them. And that is around how do we streamline capital raising? And then also how do you actually leverage your employee equity to be able to build a great team? Um, so, so that's a, a brief introduction for myself. Um, we'll, you can see here um, on the agenda of what we're gonna go through today. Um, I'll be talking to the first couple of points here. Um, then I'll hand over Alex to run us through the safe note and con notes and term sheets. Uh, and then Brent will go through some of the investor and board management and governance issues at the end. And then, as I said, we'll leave time for Q&A at the end of all that. So uh, maybe Brent, if I can hand over to you to do a brief intro and, and, uh, and, and say hello. Yeah, sure. So uh, kia ora and uh, hello to everyone. So I've been doing startups for 10 years now. First one, not so successful. We sold it for $4,000 after a, taking in a quarter of a million or so of investment. Board Pro, I'm pleased to report it's going much better. So it's a board management software platform. So we serve 1,700 customers in 26 countries around the world. We fundamentally streamline and, and um, improve the, the, the board management process, so running, running meetings, building agendas, board packs, everything to do with the board process. And uh, my background before that was in ICT, where I built a data center and internet service provider business with my co-founder, you know, with one of the team there uh, who's come across and a co-founder with me in this business. Over to you, Alex. Yes. Hi, everyone. So I'm Alex. I'm the co-founder of Sprint Law. Um, I am a lawyer by trade. So um, I started Sprint Law in early 2017, but prior to that was working at one of the sort of large corporate law firms as a corporate lawyer and a technology lawyer um, for about five years. But before that, I also was working in the tech industry, um, started a small uh, app development agency, which um, I ended up sort of exiting. So um, I have that kind of background of technology and law, which I then put together to start Sprint Law back in 2017. Um, we basically provide simple legal services to startups and small businesses. Uh, the idea is to make legal services easy, accessible and affordable and, and really be an alternative to the more traditional, um, you know, expensive legal providers. Uh, we are a startup ourselves. We've grown, taken venture investment and grown. And so been through some of this process of raising capital a couple of times. Um, we're now a team of, I think about 55. It's always growing each week, active in Australia and the UK and have a bit over 3000 clients. Um, so yeah, looking forward to talking about some of the capital raising uh, legal side of things, which we've certainly advised lots of clients on uh, and, and have been through ourselves. Awesome, thanks, Alex. Um, so I'll just start, kick things off and, and uh, everyone can see the slides here. Yeah. Okay, so um, just a bit of background on Cake. Um, so yeah, Cake is a SaaS platform that as I said, um, the reason why, why we exist is to really help um, simplify 
um, take a lot of the confusion and also a lot of the cost and also save a lot of the time associated with founders executing capital raising, um, but then also actually uh, provide um, a, a really simple and cost effective way for founders to be able to actually facilitate giving equity to their team because that whole process can be not only really expensive in terms of setting up your plan rules and your offer letters and everything in the first place, but then when you're managing you know, multiple employees on time-based vesting uh, and it's a four-year vesting schedule, it can be it can, it can uh, chew up an enormous amount of time and energy um, just administering um, your employee equity schemes as well. So we, um, we have uh, yeah, over 2,000 companies using Cake Worldwide. Um, Australia was our beachhead market. Um, we are now in the US, UK, uh, Singapore, New Zealand, uh, India. <clears throat> um, so in multiple countries, we'll be in 30 countries by the end of this year. We are the first and really only truly global cap table uh, platform. And we think that's really important because what we're seeing is more and more um, a, a globalization of, of, of um, capital flows in the startup space, you know, investors coming down from the US investing in New Zealand, Australia and other countries, um, but also actually globalization in terms of startup teams as well, right? So, you know, the, the remote first global teams means that not only do you have to find a way to hire people and also um, pay them in, in other countries, but if you're a startup, equity is part of that equation as well. So being able to actually facilitate those equity grants across multiple countries is really difficult um, and has been prohibitive historically. So we're on a mission to actually simplify that and, and, and enable um, startups around that. So um, yeah, I won't talk a lot about the platform. I'll, I'll, I'll send you some information and, and show you, um, you'll be able to have a look at that post that. But what I'm gonna go through today is just a bit of an overview of, around um, uh, capital raising for startups. Um, and then we've actually got a great tool, which is a capital raising toolkit. And we break that into sort of three parts of preparation, marketing and closing of a round. Um, I won't go through a huge amount of detail on that, but what I will do is highlight some of the tools that are in that toolkit. And then post the presentation, we'll send out a copy of the toolkit to you so you can actually work through that. Um, so yeah, look, pretty much every, every startup, there's the odd one that bootstraps, but pretty much every um, startup, um, you know, is, goes through that valley of death uh, piece where, they're, they're not cash flow uh, positive and they need funding to be able to actually get their you know, idea off the ground, build their MVP, start to actually build um, revenue uh, before they get to that break even point. And then most startups, even once they get to that break even point, I, I heard, um, I read an article by a New Zealand um, angel investor, I can't remember his name, but he was talking about this notion of what he calls porpoising, right? So the startups have a plan to get back to break even, they nearly get back to break even, and then they come up with a great idea to actually go into an adjacent market or expand globally or do something else to actually take them to that next level. They end up having to raise again and then going negative again and, and, and getting back there. So that's why we're talking about capital raising today. We have been through a really heady time, historically high levels of investment in startup um, startups over the last 12 months or so. You've seen some in, uh, incredible valuations. You've seen all term records broken in terms of capital flows into, into the startup ecosystem. But um, now we're going through a bit of a wobble, right? You know, so, you know, global equity markets are actually selling off. You've got a lot of risk um, uh, um, uh, coming back in with, you know, the, the war in Ukraine, you've got inflation coming back in, et cetera. So when you're thinking about um, raising in, in the current environment, you need to be cognizant of that, you know, and you need to actually have a plan around what that means for you and your startup. So things like, you know, you might need to be more realistic about winding back some of your valuation ex expectations in, in the current environment. Or, or, or if you don't want to do that, you might need to actually adjust your expectations around how long it's going to take you to execute that raise, right? Because what might have taken you six months previously might take you nine months because your investors are a little bit more risk averse. The thing I will say is that um, even through the whole global financial crisis and the pullback investment through that period of time, if you do have the good, if you have the right idea and you've got the right investment team and you pitch it properly, you will get investors, right? but you do need to actually adjust your expectations around how that process is gonna go. And also perhaps what valuation you're actually gonna be able to achieve and how much you're gonna be able to raise based on the current current environment. And, and we have certainly seen a change between what it was in say Q3, Q4 of last year to what we're seeing in Q2 of 2022. Okay, so 
what are some of the typical rounds that you'd actually be looking at um, when you're actually raising? So um, it's important to understand that investors will actually have an expectation around the amount of equity that they're actually getting, um, you're giving away in, in, in each round, raise round, the valuation that you're looking to achieve in that, and then also the actual amount of money you're actually raising. And here's a bit of a guide around some of the typical rounds. So in a pre-seed round, really early stage, uh, might be pre-revenue, you know, generally you'd be looking to raise 10 to 20%, um, give away 20, 10 to 20% of equity. Um, that's gonna translate through into, you know, probably um, a raise amount somewhere between 200 and 400K um, and a one to three mil valuation, right? At that stage, even, you might be wanting to also look at putting an ESOP in place because most early stage companies are actually looking to engage advisors or even early stage hires uh, outside the co-founders um, and they'd be looking to actually give equity as part of that component, right? And then you get to a seed round, you can see the valuation, you can see the, the, the amount you're looking to raise and, and therefore um, uh, the amount of equity you're actually giving away there. Um, so so the, the key thing to understand here is that when you are going and talking to investors, they will have these buckets that they're expecting to see um, startups falling into. Now, it depends on what sort of startup you are. If you're a deep tech startup or if you're a med tech startup, your valuations are probably going to be different and your ask is going to be different to this. But if you're a SaaS-based plat based platform or a fintech or something like that, then this is typically what you're going to be seeing going to be um, what investors are going to be expecting to see when you're going to be pitching to them. So it's important that you understand this. It's important that you align to this. And it's important that you actually understand what other people are, out, are being able to achieve in your market for similar types of, biz, uh, of startups at similar stages at that particular time. So do your research, understand where you need to pitch, because if you pitch something wildly different to this, um, the chances are um, it's going to make it that much more difficult for you to actually successfully raise. Okay, so as you go through those rounds, um, you'll have um, uh, what we call dilution happening to the equity that the co-founders actually have. And you can see here an example, you can see seed round series A, series B, series C. Um, and what you can see here is in the initial um, in the initial uh, uh, stage here, the lead founder or the or the, or the CEO has 30% shareholdings so when they actually get to that seed round, right? And you can see in this round here, they've got a, 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 a they've raised one mil on a four mil pre-money valuation, so the post-money bell is five mil, and they've given away 20% equity at that point in time, right? By the time they get out to series C here, you can see that the actual shareholding for the um, that lead founder is actually reduced to 12%, right? Which is, you know, they've got a much smaller slice of that pie, right? But what they're actually betting on is they've actually put those use, those um, funds that they've raised to good use. And in that time, they've increased the size of the pie um, dramatically. And you can see that here. So they've gone from a you know one mil raise on a four mil pre-val. So their post money val was five mil. At series C, their post money val is actually a hundred mil, right? Because they've raised 20 mil on an 80 mil pre-val, right? So what does that mean for you as a CEO? It means that I've actually gone from actually having 30% shareholding of a five mil valuation company. So effectively my ownership is worth one and a half mil to when I'm, by the time I'm at series C here, yes, I've only got a 12% ownership by that stage, but it's 12% of a hundred mil val company. And therefore the, the, the value of my ownership has gone from one and a half mil to 12 mil. So it's nearly 10 X through those ranges, right? It's really important that as you go through, through raising, that you understand this concept of dilution, that you actually think about not only how much equity I'm giving away in this round, but how much equity am I likely to actually have to give away to my employees? Because you're gonna to have to have an ESOP to actually share that with them. And that's gonna cause dilution as well. But also in those subsequent rounds, how much am I gonna to have to give away? Um, Brett, we talked a little bit about this earlier on and, and, and you know we were having a discussion about going through multiple raids. I don't know if you've got any insights on that or, or, or how to, you know, any advice to how, how people should be, think, founders should be thinking about this. Yeah, sure. Look, my advice would be to learn about this early, um, form a view, 
um, about what's possible and manage this actively. The, the difficulty my co-founder and I fell into, we were, we were just so busy, you know, trying to execute on the business. It's really difficult in the early days trying to achieve product market fit. You take your eye off the ball and all of a sudden you, you're, you're running low on money and you become a price taker. So you want to put yourself in the position of being a price maker as much as possible. Um, so that would be my broad advice. Yep. And there's a brilliant article that I read on on um, on Medium, which I'll share after this, which is actually talks about, you know, realistically, um, the time frame for you before you actually start a raise to when you actually get the money in the door is at least six months if you do a good job. You know, you've got a three month marketing phase and then a three month actually closing the deal out phase. And sometimes it can be even longer than that. Like we actually had an agreement to fund us in July last year and didn't get the money for another three to four months, right? Because we actually had to flip up to the US. So be realistic about how long it'll take. Be proactive in terms of starting that process early and it'll help you stay in the driver's seat. And, and you know, particularly in an environment like we're heading into at the moment where investors are going to be a little bit more risk averse, you need to be, you need to be very proactive around thinking about this. Okay, so, um, one of the things to understand is what investors' um, uh, expectations are in terms of investing in you. So this is important, and it's important to understand that you know there are some great businesses out there that are actually going to be able to provide impressive returns, but you know in an early stage they're not going to be able to provide anywhere near 100% return per annum. Um, if you are pitching to startup VCs, if you're pitching to startup investors, it's important that you understand that these are the type of the returns they're looking at. So how do you generate that? Well, 100% return per annum would be doubling your valuation every 12 months, right? It's not paying them at dividends or profit, but it's about actually doubling that valuation. Um, so it's, you know, in later stage companies that might come back to 50 to 70%, but you know, the VCs are looking for like a 20, 20X 20 return over five to 15 years. Why are they looking for such huge returns? Well, the rule of thumb around investing, particularly in early stage startups, is that out of 10 startups, seven of them will probably fall over, so you get no return from them. Two of them might provide a, a, a positive return, but there's actually going to be one outlier in that portfolio that's actually going to provide the majority of the portfolio return. So if, you're, if, you can't, if they can't see you as a potential outlier with the ability to be able to actually provide that outlier return, then chances are they're not going to invest in you at the end of the day, right? So it's important to understand that when you're actually pitching to startup investors. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, the raise framework now. As I said, we've got a capital raise toolkit, which I'll send to you uh, post the presentation. But what I'm going to be talking through in these slides is some of the tools that are actually in that. So the first tip around actually um, raising is, is simplify everything you're doing, right? So there are a bunch of awesome tools out there that you can actually use without having to reinvent the wheel. You know, there's, if you're early stage capital raising, there's safe note templates, there's, there's, there's con note templates out there you can tap into. They're actually in the Cake platform. So if you get onto Cake, you can access them for free, right? Um, there are tools out there for cap um, table modeling, which is, you know, what we talked about, understanding how, how you might be diluted over time. You know, there's tools out there for valuation, et cetera. So don't reinvent, try to re reinvent the wheel out, out there. Tap into the tools that are out there and also tap into good advisors who know what they're doing in that space and get, get the right advice as you go through that process. So as I said, we'll talk about preparation, marketing, closing. In the What are we talking about in the preparation phase? So we're talking about preparing pitch decks. So, you know, there's, you'll need a short pitch deck and the purpose of that will be to get your foot in the door with the uh, investors to actually get their interest and actually to get a proper meeting so you can actually pitch them properly. Once you do that, you'll need a longer, more detailed pitch deck, right? And depending on what stage you're at, will we'll actually also drive the amount of, of, uh, of uh, detail in there. There are some great resources out there to actually show you what you need to do and, and, and some great pitch decks. So tap into those. You'll need a data room. You know, even doing a pre-seed round, they'll need to see what your cap table looks like. They'll see, need to see your company constitution and that sort of stuff. Understand what you need to provide them, have it prepared early on. You don't want to be scratching around if an investor says, yeah, I'm really interested in investing in you and you haven't got your data room ready and it takes you a month to get it all ready, right? You need to have it ready early on. 
think about valuation, you know. Um, Brett, we also talked a little bit about valuation, right, and how hard it is for an early stage company to actually get land on a valuation um, uh, um, for, for their startup, yeah? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My advice there would be, so it's much easier in the US. They, their rule of thumb when you're starting out is they, they don't give away more than 20% in any round. They're raising a million dollars really early out of the gate. Um, so the, the evaluations are much higher generally at the very early stages than in, than in Australasia. So I would be working very hard as an early stage um, uh, founder to, there, there's little things like the back of the napkin valuation model. So grab resources like that, uh, get a very good story as to why you're worth more than the typical, you know, most angel investors, I believe in New Zealand and Australia will peg you to revenue very, very early, too early. So you've got to be very assertive and knowing your story and pitching. And then, then as you move on, you can get into the more standard, you know, it becomes much easier. It's a, you know, a multiple of your ARR and it becomes much simpler. Yep. So, so some of those um, uh, valuation tools we have in here, the Berkus method and different things that if you're really early stage, um, so, so they are in the, in the toolkit. The other thing you can do is actually, you know, if you use a safe note or a con note, which Alex will talk about a little bit later on, um, they can actually avoid you having to focus too much on valuation early on. There's a bunch of other stuff in here. You know, Brett, we talked about um, dilution. So how you understand that is you model out not only this cap table round, but the, the next few. So there's modeling tools in there. There's some links to um, uh, legal docs in here. Um, there's, you know, investor communication is really important, right? You know, so uh, um, particularly more sophisticated investors won't invest in you unless they have that trust and relationship. So you need to not say, you know, contact me, uh, contact, you now and then I'm gonna gonna ask you to actually invest in me three months or six months later. No, I need to be communicated with along the way. I need to know your story. I need to see the momentum you're building in order to be able to build that relationship and that trust for me to be able to write you a check at the end of the day. So that so there's a bunch of really good tools in there and and, and just make sure that you've actually um, tap into those tools. Also make sure you're working with the right partner. Someone like Sprint Law on, on, on the legal side is absolutely critical. They know what they're doing in the startup space. You can have the best law in the world, but if they don't know what they're doing in the startup space, you're wasting your time and money, right? Get someone who knows what they're doing. Um, how much should you raise? Um, so, you know, part of it, realistically, what you want to do focus on is, is how much you need to get yourself to the next logical um, set of milestones. You do need to be careful, you know, particularly in the heady environment that we've actually just come through. You're seeing companies sort of almost raise too much capital if, there, if there's such a thing. What you've got to understand is the more capital you raise is actually comes with more dilution and it also comes with greater expectations in terms of you delivering growth, right? So, so backward engineer, understand what's that next stage for your startup, how much money you need to get there, plus a bit of a buffer, um, and then actually reverse engineer your valuation you need to get to from there, right? So that's that's the best way to think about how much you actually need um, to raise. And then as Brett said, be really conscious about what that means also in terms of the, the, the how much equity you're giving away and therefore the dilution as well. So that's the sort of preparation stage. Now we're on to the marketing stage. So this is where we're actually starting to actually uh, reach out to investors. So one of the things that you will have done in that preparation phase is you will in build an investor list, right? And building an investor list and, and, and raising is no different to running a sales funnel, right? So if I wanna sell five widgets, I probably need to start talking to 40 different clients in, at the top of my sales funnel. And it's the same with your investor list, right? So if you need five investors to invest, you know, 50K each in you at the end of the day, um, then you need to actually start off probably talking to 30 or 40 investors, right? Because um, that's, that that you, you you will thin them out as you go through that process. So once you get to the, the, the marketing phase, that's when you're going to start to actually reach out to them. That's when you're going to start um, having meetings with them and actually using the information you actually prepared in the last one. Um, so this is an example here of where you're actually, this is in pounds, but this is actually um, thinking about how you're actually going to reach the right amount of investors to to uh, build that list, but also actually thinking about how much of them will each raise. So do a spreadsheet, um, talk, 
identify the types of investors you're targeting, or identify the likely check size they're going to be able to write, and make sure you're actually talking to enough of them. And then the last thing is the closing part here. So once you actually have that agreement to, yes, I'm going to invest, there's still a lot of work to do, right? You've got to agree to deal terms. You've got to actually go through that due diligence. They've got, got to actually confirm everything that you've actually said. Um, you've got to um, you know, get subscription agreements um, uh, executed. You've got to issue share certificate, update regulators, et cetera. So don't just think it all, it all, all stops once you've actually got a, an agreement to invest in you. There's still a lot of work to actually do post that. Cake actually streamlines a lot of that and Alex will actually talk more about some of the instruments you use to execute that. So with that, I'll, I'll hand over to you, Alex, and, and maybe you can go through a little bit more on the different types of raised instruments and then also term sheets. Absolutely. Sounds good. So um, just to pick up uh, sort of where Cal left off, uh, as, as you get to the, the pointy end of, of being uh, sort of ready to um, secure an investment, uh, this is where the legal stuff starts to come in. And you want to start thinking about, well, what are all the different legal things I need to do to be ready for a capital raise? And then second of all, what are the documents that I'm actually going to be using to formalize the raise? And this stuff's really important because, you know, um, in, in the legal documents or legal transactions you make in your business, the investment documents and, the, and those transaction documents can be some of the most important. And it's important not to treat them like other things you may have done in your business earlier on where you haven't put much thought into them. Maybe you've just used a template without understanding what's in it because these things can be worth sort of millions of dollars. So very important to put a little bit of extra emphasis on the legal side as you are starting to come up to um, to close a capital, a capital raise. Um, before we get into the transaction documents, one thing I think it's important um, for, for every startup to um, be thinking about is using the capital raise as an opportunity to sort of give yourself a little bit of a legal health check and make sure that you've got some of those fundamental um, legal tasks and risks sorted out before you're going out and speaking to investors. Uh, oftentimes in the early stages of your business, you're going to be, um, you know, um, uh, bootstrapping, you're not going to have spent all of the money you, you may have wished you could have spent on, on speaking to lawyers and, and having sorted out the legal side. And, uh, but you do want to be in a situation when if you're discussing with investors aspects of your business regulations or protections or things that you um, should really have sorted out, you want to make sure you, you're across them and you've either done them or you're, you're about to do them uh, so that you know, you're, not, um, you're, you're, you're not looking unprepared for those conversations. I've got a few different areas of, of, of sort of, um, of legal concern you might want to be thinking about. Um, obviously, our team can help you work through them um, if you're preparing for an investment. But just to flag a couple of them, one thing startups often do just before a capital raise is uh, look at their business structure. You may have set up as a single entity, a single PTY LTD company. It's quite common to restructure into a dual company structure or, or, um, or a more sophisticated structure. And the advantage of having a, a more sophisticated structure before you take investment is really that you can have a sort of operating company that goes out and does business with your clients and then a separate holding company that receives the investment and holds your company's important intellectual property. And what that means is um, the investors are invested in uh, that kind of top level parent company, the holding company, um, but your clients are dealing with um, your, your bottom level operating company, which means if something goes wrong uh, in the course of your business, clients may have a claim, may be able to sue your operating company, but they won't be able to touch the important assets, your intellectual property, and potentially the cash, which can sit in your holding entity. So having those two companies or multiple company structure is quite a good thing to get set up before you raise investment. Doing it early on can also have tax benefits. If you know Some companies wait until a little bit later in their journey to do the restructure, but there can be a cost in, in waiting too long. So looking at your business structure is one thing to think about before you raise. Uh, the other um, is your intellectual property. And one of the big things I see a lot of startups uh, miss is um, actually owning their name and their brand, making sure they've registered trademarks, um, not just in uh, you know New Zealand or Australia where you are, but also in uh, other countries that you're intending on expanding to. Um, I've seen too many companies actually get through the process of raising investment and, and you know start investing in spending all their funds, um, building all their brand assets, buying all their products, only to find out that they actually don't own their name or their logo. And we've had actually a couple of clients have to rebrand and change their name at a massive cost. And in some cases, it put them out of business. It's a simple thing to do. If you've got a name or a brand that you're attached to and that you're investing in, make sure that you protect it. It takes about nine months um, to get trademarks fully registered. So it's something to start early. 
Um, so yeah, those are the two things, uh, getting your trademarks and other IP protected and your company structure, I think is quite important. And there's other areas, contracts and things you might want to just clean up before you, you go out and speak to investors. Then just moving on uh, to the next slide. Um, uh, once you uh, come to the point um, of thinking about uh, the different types of raises, um, I think you need to click one more time, Cal, to show, yeah, maybe just show them all, yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's um, uh, different ways that you can raise investment. So um, Cal touched on this earlier, but there's sort of three common approaches that we see in the startup space um, under which startups will raise capital. The first and the most common is the straight equity approach. Um, essentially, you will set a valuation for the company. Um, investors will invest X, X dollars and receive Y percent of the company right away. So, you know, you might, um, let's say you raise um, at a $1 million valuation and investors invest 100K, uh, you know, they're going to be getting 10% of the company um, for their investment, if that makes sense. Um, so that's the kind of um, simplest way to understand how uh, an equity investment works. And, and that's often um, what's going to happen in, in a capital raise scenario. And oftentimes, uh, you know, you'll be spending time speaking to investors, negotiating the valuation, negotiating the percentages and other, other aspects of those commercial terms. Um, and, uh, you know, as your business grows, um, as per that slide Cal showed earlier with the percentages changing over time, um, it's kind of, that's how, how the equity works uh, at that point, you're, um, sort of giving up the percentages, um, stage by stage, uh, and you end up being diluted over time. So, um, that's kind of, um, the, the, the most straightforward way that, that a raise happens, but there's a couple of other instruments that are very popular with startups. Um, it's still on that previous slide, Cal, sorry. Sorry, um, um, we've got, um, the um, convertible note <clears throat> and um, sorry, sorry, just give me a minute. Oh, good. Perfect. Yeah. I'll, so keep, I'll keep my hand away from the keyboard, mate. Sorry. <laughs> oh, all good. All good. Um, so yeah, um, I was just talking about straight equity, but then we have these other two instruments that you can use for um, for raising. One's the convertible note, and the other is a safe note, and they're relatively similar sorts of instruments. So the convertible note um, is is a is a type of raising investment that you often use between equity rounds. Um, some people call it um, a bridging instrument. So it bridges you between two equity rounds, although you can use it before the first time you've even raised equity. Um, and it's the same with the safe note. I like to describe these things as sort of like buying early bird tickets to the equity show or pre-sale tickets to the equity show, equity show, if you will. So the way a convertible note works is an investor will invest um, X dollars. So let's say it's $100,000 in the business um, and uh, they will be entitled to an unknown percentage of the company um, and it will depend on the valuation at the next straight equity raise. And so typically the way that works with a convertible note is someone invests 100K, it looks like a loan to begin with. They'll be getting interest on their 100K loan. Um, you know, if it's 10% uh, interest, um, after 12 months, that 100K will have turned into 110K. Now, in often um, times with a convertible note, even though it's a loan, you don't actually repay it. You just keep topping up the principal. So it keeps increasing over time. So. 100k investment becomes 110k after a year, and and you know maybe it, it will become um, uh, and and will continue to increase over time. Uh, but when the company gets around to doing its equity raise, that 110k or whatever the principal amount is will convert into equity at the valuation of that next equity raise. Um, and so uh, the investor is really buying equity, but they're buying it earlier and they'll be able to convert when the equity round happens. Now there's a, a multiple different forms of convertible note, but the one I sketched out is, is one of the most common forms of it. And the advantage of using a convertible note is um, it's a little bit quicker and easier to, to, to do, um, to issue uh, rather than doing a straight equity raise. Oftentimes it's used with angel investors who, you know, they don't know what your company's worth. They don't want to set a valuation on your company. They would prefer for a more sophisticated institutional investor to be valuing your company. Um, so all they want is they want um, uh, to invest now and um, and then receive a percentage that someone else will determine is fair for the for for the startup. So that's how the convertible note works. Um, oftentimes in a convertible note, there's also a discount, which is why I use the term um, early bird tickets or pre-sale tickets. 
uh, they'll get a discount on the price per share paid by the uh, other investors that came in later at the equity round. So um, they got in early, they invested early in exchange for investing early, they get um, interest on the amount they've invested and they'll get a discount um, on the rate at the next round. And that's the benefit of them uh, not actually getting the shares at the time they invest. And the safe note is very similar to the convertible note. It's just simpler. It typically doesn't have interest or loan. Um, it's, it's a simple sort of um, few page document um, which kind of does the same thing. It has an investment amount, let's say 100K, and it will say, um, you know, I, the investor, and investing 100K in this company, and I'm going to get a, you know, 10, 20%, whatever it is, discount at the company's next uh, capital raise um, as compared to the price per share paid by investors at the next straight equity round. So um, we're seeing the convertible note and, the, and particularly the safe note be a much more common way, particularly of early stage startups in raising investment. Um, you rather than having to organize a large straight equity round where you have um, you know, a whole bunch of investors, everyone agrees with the valuation at the same time, you set a value for the company and you give up a percentage of the company, um, you can uh, instead over a period of you know, three to six months, find several angel investors, get them to invest smaller checks, 50, 100K checks that can add up, that can help your business build traction, help your business build revenue, help increase the valuation of your business. And then you go out and raise a straight equity round at which time the safe note or the convertible notes will convert. And while those early investors get a discount, you've been able to use their funds to actually grow the value of the business um, beyond what that discount is. Uh, and ultimately as a founder, you end up giving away less dilution. So um, it's simple uh, and, and becoming very, very popular to use these instruments. Alex, I'll just add, add on with the, safe notes and con notes like you know they they can also be pretty effective as a bridging tool between rounds as well right so you know if you're looking in the current environment let's say you're you know you're, you're actually struggling to get the valuation that you want between rounds then even if you've done an equity round uh previously you can use these instruments in between rounds right let's say you've got an existing investor that wants to support you again then that can be a quick and easy way to get some funds in the door to get you through to actually, you know, maybe when valuations are a little bit more robust and you have a little bit more traction and you, and you can execute that um, next equity rate, equity round. Absolutely. And, and in fact, that's sort of what Sprint Law has done. I mean, our, our raising history was we, our first capital raise we did on safe notes from angel investors. Then we had an equity round where those safes converted then we did more safes as a bridging round, um, it, it, as Cal was just describing, uh, and then you know had a second equity round where those safes converted. So um, yeah, it's certainly a tool that can be used um, in between rounds. Cool. Uh, now onto the le legal side of things. So um, those are the different options uh, I just mentioned around how the raise can work. And depending on which route you go down, the legal documents you use will be a little bit different. Um, typically though, there's, um, four key types of documents that you're going to be thinking about um, to document uh, your capital raise. And, and, and these things really come in at the end of the, of the process that Cal was talking about, uh, you know, around the time you've finished your due diligence, you've, you've been speaking to, to your investors for a little while, and you're getting towards the pointy end where you're now going to start looking at how to finalize the deal. And that's when the lawyers really get started when, when um, you know, you've, you've, um, found your investors and you're starting to negotiate the terms of your deal. So typically there'll be a document called a term sheet. A term sheet is a really short, usually a couple of page, two to three page document, um, which is not legally binding. It's almost like a handshake agreement, but in written form. Um, and it's intended to just have a summary of the key terms of the deal. Um, and it's going to set out, you know, if it's an equity investment, what is the investment amount? What's the valuation? What percentage is being given up? And what other rights are investors going to get? Control rights, um, you know, voting rights, and so on in 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 the company. Um, so a short shortish form document, um, and it's meant to be a summary of the longer form documents to come. And it becomes the tool that's often negotiated between investor and company uh, because it's easier to negotiate a shorter document than actually having the longer form legal docs that, that will come. So the term sheet's the first stage. Um, uh, often, if you're speaking to an institutional investor, they will send you their term sheet, so they'll prepare the term sheet. Sometimes, if you're conducting the round yourself, you know you will prepare the term sheet and um, and you will. Uh, sort of circulate it to different kinds of investors. Um, I think we just had a question. Um, dual company structure, what's the best time to look into it? Pre-revenue, pre-raise. In our case, we already have a single entity set up. Uh, look, if you're going to be a, um, a business that's looking to um, really scale up and, and, and grow longer term, um, I would do the dual thing. 
uh, as, as sort of as soon as possible. I mean, we set up at Sprint Law a dual company structure from day one, like pre-revenue, pre-everything. Um, you can convert to it later. It's just the longer that you wait, the more administration and the more potential tax costs there are. Um, there are ways to avoid uh, you know, CGT events and, 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 and tax events if you do it earlier on. But if you, if you wait later, it can be um, quite a cost. And, and there's also the administration of changing your bank accounts and, and a whole bunch of other things. So um, it doesn't cost that much for the benefit it provides. So yeah, I'll be looking at it um, as early as you can afford it. Um, so coming back to the legal documents, I talked a little bit about the term sheet um, as that kind of non-binding document. Flowing from the term sheet, we have um, these the definitive tra uh, transaction documents, which are mentioned in the term sheet. So there's really three types of documents that are going to have to be signed um, to uh, to formalize an investment. The first is a shareholders agreement. So that's a document that's signed by all the shareholders of the company. Uh, the shareholders agreement is going to say, you know, um, here are the rights of investors. Here are the rights of founders. Here are who the board of directors are. Here are the decisions that require approval of the investors. Here are the decisions that don't. Uh, what happens if one founder wants to leave? What happens if one founder wants to sell their shares? What happens if an investor wants to sell their, sell their shares? All of those mechanics around different situations um, you know, are negotiated in the term sheet and then recorded in this shareholders agreement. So it's a very, very important document. Um, and, it, and it becomes particularly important in the event that people want to exit their investment or, or sort of leave the organization. The constitution um, is a similar document that's kind of a, a constituent document of the organization. Um, these days, co constitutions are, um, are fairly standard. A lot of those specific terms around the control of the company live in the shareholders agreement, but the constitution sets out the process for board meetings, the process for voting at board meetings, and some more administrative as aspects of, of how um, the company is run. In some cases, investors will ask for special types of shares shares which entitle them to additional rights as, as compared to other investors. So those, share, those terms of shares are often contained in the company constitution. So those are kind of the governance documents, the shareholders agreement, the constitution, and then you have the transaction document. So this is the really investment agreement, the document under which the investor says, I'm going to give you X dollars in exchange for, you know, Y percentage of the company, or in the case of the safe note and convertible note, in exchange for X percent discount um, or X percent interest on the amount that I invest. Um, so that's the third type of document. And so um, you start with the term sheet, you negotiate it, and then they, they crystallize into these other documents that are signed to close the raise. Um, in the process of doing all this stuff, particularly um, uh, if the investors have identified some legal risks, there are sometimes other documents, IP assignment deeds, employment agreements, service agreements that may need to be put in place if you haven't already had them. Um, so it may not be limited to just these three documents, um, but that's, that, those vary on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, can just move to the next slide. Um, I, just quickly, um, uh, you know, um, when you're negotiating the term sheet and then ultimately preparing that shareholders agreement, uh, investors will uh, potentially be asking for more than just a percentage of the company. They might want some rights uh, to, you know, appoint directors to your board. They might want some um, some uh, comfort that if, if one of the key founders is going to leave, they're not going to walk away with uh, a large percentage of the organization. The founders may have to stay for a period of time in order to totally have ownership over their shares. So often you have this concept of founder vesting that requires founders to stay a certain amount of time after the investment's made. Um, restraints stopping you know, key members um, uh, of the organization going and starting competitive business. Pro rata rights, which means you know, investors may ask um, for the right to top up their investment if you raise further capital um, so that they maintain their effective percentage um, and other things, uh, access to information and warranties to make sure that what you've told them about the, the company and what you continue to tell them about the company is actually true and you're not misleading them. Um, and then finally, there can be these uh, what we call preferential investor rights. So um, one is a liquidity preference. If, if um, the investor uh, invests um, at uh, a certain um, a certain amount, they might want to uh, ensure that if the company eventually, you know, goes insolvent or sells at a lower amount, rather than just getting their percentage back, uh, they're entitled in that event of liquidity um, to at least get a refund of what they've invested rather than getting, you know, if they only have 10%, 10% of the lower um, uh, liquidity price of the company. So it's a kind of protection in the worst case scenario investors often ask for. And the, and the last is an anti-dilution. So if you raise an investment round at a at a you know $10 million valuation, but then a year later you raise at a $6 million valuation, 
the investor will say, well, you know, you didn't perform like you told me you would perform. Um, why are new investors getting to come in at a better deal than what I got? Uh, and so in that scenario, there's often a formula which gives the investors some top up, some additional shares in the event that, uh, you know, the company doesn't perform as expected. Um, so those are what things uh, to be aware of, very important terms. Of, obviously, they're gonna affect your ownership and control of the organization. So you wanna make sure if you're agreeing to any of those things, you understand what you're agreeing to um, uh, before kind of uh, signing it all away. I think, Alex, that, that would be, you know, um, we talked about dilution and understanding that. Um, you know, some of these terms here might sound like a foreign language to, to founders, right? If you haven't dealt with it but it's absolutely critical that you and your co-founders understand what these things mean. And it's also, uh, it's critical that you understand what's a reasonable, um, fair and equitable outcome between the investor and also the founders um, and that the, you arrive on, on, on an equitable outcome. If you end up agreeing to terms which are prohibitive for your startup and for your founders in an early round, it will discourage investors coming in in subsequent rounds. So it's not only, it's understanding these, making sure that your investors are actually giving you fair terms, both for yourself and also for them, they're fair and reasonable. And understand that if you agree to stuff that's prohibited at this point, it will impact your ability to be able to attract further investment down the track. It could also have massive impacts in terms of your ability to actually maintain control of your company and do all those sort of things. So it's super important, just as we talked about dilution, that you understand these terms and you think not only what you're doing for this raise round, but you're thinking for the subsequent ones as well. Absolutely. Um, I just noticed a question um, from Chris um, uh, a few minutes ago. Um, who was just asking, in setting up a dual company structure, when would you form a limited company as opposed to a PTY LTD as a holding company? Uh, Chris, limited companies, um, which are uh, referred to as, as sort of public companies, um, are not typically used in startup in, uh, in startup structures. Uh, normally, the time at which you're converting from a private to a public company is, uh, you know, at an IPO when you're listing, or in some circumstances, if you end up with more than 50 shareholders um, in the organization, uh, you know, you're required by the Corps Act, with a couple of exceptions um, for crowdsourced equity funding, you're required by the Corporations Act to um, to have a, a public company. But generally, uh, if you're an early early or mid stage startup, um, you know from from pre seed up to Series B, um, you're not going to be wanting to use the public company st structure in most circumstances. So you're you're pretty much going to have two PTY LTD companies: one's the holding, and one's your kind of operating company. Um, uh, I, I I ran through this a bit earlier. I'm conscious of time, but um, just to give a quick uh, recap of the of the terms in the safe and the convertible notes, um, these instruments have um, the the discount amount, the investment amount, and then they'll have a conversion trigger. So that'll be the event that occurs, um, which will trigger the the bridging round or the safe round to convert into equity. So if people have bought these, as I said, pre-sale or early bird investments, um, uh, uh, you know that they will be triggered by that straight equity round that happens later. And then um, one term I didn't mention is a valuation cap, which we have at the top here. So a valuation cap is often included in a safe and a convertible note. Um, so the way a valuation cap works, let's say I'm an investor that invests in a safe note and um, you know uh, the company says, look, I'll, I'll take your 100K, I'll give you a 10% discount on the valuation of my company um, when it does its straight equity round. Um, but then you know the company, um, you know, waits two years, it explodes, it becomes worth $100 million. And the investor says, well, I invested when you were um, very early stage, why am I only getting a 10% discount on your $100 million valuation? Uh, you know, that doesn't reflect the risk that I took by investing so early. So oftentimes you set a cap, which says, well, you'll get a discount, but if the valuation blows out, um, we're going to just set a cap on what that valuation will be. So you might set a cap in the scenario described of $10 million, which means that, um, that you know, the investor will get a 10% discount up until the valuation goes above $10 million. And then if it goes above $10 million, the investor will convert as if the valuation was $10 million. So that's a term that's um, often included in the safe notes in addition to the discount. Um, and then the final thing we have here is the interest and maturity date. Interest really only applies to the convertible notes. Very rare to have interest on a safe note, but sometimes there's a maturity date. If you uh, have these pre-sale tickets to the show, but the show doesn't happen for, for three or four years, um, you know, safe investors may not want to just be sitting on uh, a safe note. They may want their percentage equity in the business. So sometimes you'll say if nothing happens in two years or one year, uh, you know, safe holders will will automatically convert at a fallback valuation that will be agreed in the safe note. Not super common.
uncommon to have maturity dates, um, uh, but, um, but it does make sense in certain circumstances. Um, and then just uh, the final point I wanted to make was um, one thing that people often forget about when they're uh, raising investment is that there are actually some laws to be aware of uh, you know, when you're going out and um, trying to get money invested into your business. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, these laws exist to protect, um, you know, individuals from being defrauded by companies that are, um, you know, promising the world, but, um, but, but not intending to deliver on it and just sort of take their money. So um, uh, there are legal requirements. Um, and uh, however, there's a bunch of exceptions to, um, to, to many of the legal requirements that apply to startup companies. So typically the default rule is if you're raising investment, you have to release these things called disclosure documents, which tell everyone all the all, all kinds of important information about your organization. Um, but uh, for for startup companies, you you usually don't need to issue these disclosure documents. So it's normally for big sort of public companies or large private companies that need to issue them. For smaller companies, you don't need to worry about issuing these disclosure documents, provided you fall into one of the exceptions to the Corporations Act. And the exceptions in Australia and New Zealand are very, very similar. They're kind of modeled off each other and they're under both uh, sort of Australian and New Zealand Corporations Act. I've got the most common exceptions that um, startups rely on on this slide. The first is that the investor that's investing is a sophisticated investor. So either they're an institutional investor or they're a high net worth or they have a salary above a certain amount. If they fall into those categories, they're okay to invest in your organization. Another one is uh, what we call the 2012-2 rule. If you're raising from um, a cap of 20 people in any 12 month period, less than $2 million, Again, generally you fall under an exception and the raise becomes easier. You don't need to issue these disclosure documents. Um, a third group is the, the relatives or close business associates. Um, if there are a, a fr basically friends or family or someone related to the organization um, in what the act determines as, as close, um, you can, you can uh, allow them to invest in your business. And uh, the final is equity crowdfunding, a relatively new regime, which um, allows you to raise equity from a crowd of investors. Uh, you do have to provide some limited form disclosure documents in the equity crowdfunding scenario. And there's caps on what you can raise. In New Zealand, it's two mil. In Australia, it's five mil. Um, but uh, it's another way um, to uh, sort of get around the requirement to issue all these disclosure documents. You really don't want to have to issue these disclosure documents because uh, it's a massive cost and a massive headache and pretty much no startup does, but it's important to make sure that you're uh, raising from the right sorts of investors um, uh, you know, that are allowed under the Corporations Act. Thanks, Alex. Um, Brett, you, hey. you, should be able, you should be able to just share your slides if you want to. Yeah, you will do. Hey, and Cal, we've only got six minutes left yeah. to your deadline. I can do a super quick um, shoot through, but um, we won't have much time left Q and A. Um, is that okay? I think I think maybe if you start, and then I, I would just encourage anyone to drop questions into the chat now, um, and and you know let, let's we'll, we'll try to get through as many of those as possible. Um, you know, I'm sure I, I, you, you can feel free to reach out to me post the uh, presentation. I'm sure Brett and Alex would be more than happy for you to reach out to them if you've got questions that we don't cover here as well. Yeah, absolutely. So what I'll do now is just give you a super simple governance framework. So just to remind you what BoardPro does, we're in the business of making governance easy and particularly for small, medium business and not for profits who are typically less mature in their, in their governance. What I'll show you here is geared towards a slightly more mature organization. So I'll talk to you very briefly about downsizing it if you're a, you're a very early stage startup. Uh, so very quickly at a high level overview, you've got your owners and stakeholders in an organization. They delegate operational control to the board who then delegates day-to-day -day operational control to the CEO and the management team. And you can kind of see there the remits that, that each of those groups hold. And really the job of those constituents is to, you know, create the desired future for the owners. In the, the, the terms of a startup, it's kind of really interesting because the owners are typically represented on the board. The, the CEO and the co-founders are typically owners as well. So you kind of get a little bit of a muddled picture there. It's not quite as pure as this. And then if you, you want to jump onto our website afterwards, we've got a plethora of resources. We have both software. And we also produce a lot of content to, to demystify and codify and simplify governance. But fundamentally, we, we've, we've coined this term minimum viable governance. 
where fundamentally it's all about five primary processes, which is fed by five primary inputs and produces five primary outputs. So if I skip on to those processes, so fundamentally the job of the board is to develop some strategic direction. Very often the, the CEO and the management team drive that, but the, the board had to own and adopt that and, and be the guardians of it. The, the best format we've ever seen of it is simply decide what are the top three or four things that have to be done within a two or three year window. Then as you move through the other aspects there, you know, boards and, and, and typically this is a little bit later on, in the early stages for a startup, if you don't find product market fit, if you don't find a scalable sales model, the business is gonna die anyway. So we'd, we'd highly encourage the early stages to strip this way down. But as you move more into that scalable stage, you're growing an organization, uh, boards should provide management with some guiding policy. And that can be as simple as a delegation policy where the board say, look, the CEO can make you know, decisions to, to apply a certain amount of funds, or funding limits, you know, employing new senior leaders on their own, or they need to have the involvement of the board or a board member. And then the others are kind of self-explanatory there, three and four. And then, then really the board's job is to run that board meeting cycle, which very typically the kind of the standard is one meeting per month, uh, usually 11 per year or skip the holiday period, but it all can be designed to suit your needs. So early stage startups, often the two or three month meeting cycle may be better. Then if we go back to the input, so, so the board sets up, you know, the, these primary processes, and then really it's management job to provide the inputs to those processes. So some form of annual operating plan, if that, again, that very early stage startup, that can be as simple as, you know, a dashboard to acquire beta users, a dashboard to convert X number of visitors into into trialists and users during that first year. As Cal said earlier, often funding will, 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 will hinge on a milestone, which might be a certain amount of beta users or the product up and going, a certain amount of new annual recurring revenue. Then outside that, so the operating plan can be very simple. Then if we move through the other inputs, you know, you review progress on that operating plan periodically. And then probably the CEO report is really the, the key there. Because remember your board members are only coming once a month. They're so short on context. Uh, often if they're investors, they've got a whole portfolio, really difficult for them to context switch. So they'll be arriving going, you know, what's exactly happening in this organization again? So if you produce a really good CEO report, if you have a look on our blog, we've got the number one CEO report uh, template in Google and the world, that'll give you a really awesome input to your board process. And then finally, just because we're, we're running towards the end. Um, so then in terms of the outputs, these are the five things that a board, if it's doing its job, should be producing. So firstly is that strategic mandate, which is often co-produced, but gives guidance to the CEO. So the board, the board might say to the CEO, look, we've agreed together, you know, we're a startup of this nature. This is our mission to make governance easy. You live in that swim lane. Um, then other outputs of the board, decisions, they need to document their decisions. They need, need to produce minutes legally by law. Um, a good board should be producing action items. So, so there's accountability and follow through. And then finally policies we've touched on. Um, I think that takes us up to time, Cal. Great, thanks, Brett. Um... Alex, I don't know whether you've got a couple of minutes to hang around, but I, I, um, if anyone does have any final questions, um, please feel free to uh, um, feel free to drop them in the chat now. As I said, I'm sure everyone's actually also happy to actually um, talk to uh, you know, people later on if they have specific questions also. So just had one question there about um, funding for um, sort of social enterprises um, or, or for purpose business where a percentage of their revenues going to, um, uh, you know, to uh, you know, charity or something like that. 
Um, I think we're seeing a lot more uh, activity in this space, right? So, um, you know, recently there's an Australian-based startup called Who Gives a Crap, um, which actually raised, I think they raised about $70 million from, um, I think, I don't know whether it was Blackbird or Airtree participated, but one of the big VCs that uh, invests both across New Zealand and Australia invested in them. Um, we've certainly seen some really strong uh, results in terms of crowdfunding from social enterprises as well. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think it's pro there's probably never been a better time for um, uh, social enterprises to be actually raising uh, funds, and and I and don't get locked into thinking there's only angels or whatever. There are there are a number of different uh, paths that you can actually use to actually target to get that investment investment as well. Yeah, agreed. And and to add to that, Cal, we have seen um, a lot more social enterprise uh, startups emerge in the last kind of two years, um, and and um, a, a lot of them receiving investment. Um, so it's definitely a space that's growing. We have we have a team that just does that kind of work at Sprint Law, um, and uh, you know, um, obviously, yeah, a lot a lot of times we're seeing not for profit businesses elect to to take the social enterprise route because it's easier to attract capital. And part of the reason they're doing that is because a lot more funding is available to those organizations, particularly as, you know, VCs um, take into account uh, a social purpose in some of their investments. So, um, so yeah, definitely a trend we're seeing as well. That's Sprint Mall. Awesome. Um, I, I think that's about it. I am conscious we've just run over time now. Um, so had a few questions as we go through about will the recording will be available? Yes, I'll send a copy of the recording to everybody who registered. Um, we'll also send you a copy of the toolkit as well. We'll also send you contact details. Um, Alex, I know you're you're on um, LinkedIn and, and Brett, you're on LinkedIn. What is, what's the best way for people to reach out for you? Just, just uh, message you in LinkedIn? Yeah. yeah. Totally fine. Yeah, if anyone wants to message me on LinkedIn and, and they have any questions flowing on from this, feel free to. Yeah, same for me, Cal. Awesome. Um, thank you very much for everybody joining joining in today. Um, thanks to Alex and, and Brett for joining. Your insights were really valuable. Um, we have really only scratched the surface here, but if you know you've got some pretty good people here, if you want to actually dig deeper into the subject, and you know as we said, make sure you do get the right partners on and the right assistance as you go through the process, because um, you know it, it 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 is it can be really challenging. Um, it is an interesting environment we're in at the moment. Make sure you're realistic about that, um, and you actually uh, think about these things early and uh, and. Best of, best, of, best of luck with your raise. I um, hope you get it done and I hope your startup uh, kills it. And, and we'd love to, you know, I'm sure all of us would like, like to work with you as you go through, through that journey. So thanks again for joining us. Cheers, thanks, everyone. Cheers, Alex. Cheers, Brett. Bye. Bye.